Welcome to Kemiras Capital Markets Day. My name is Tero Huovinen and I'm Head of Investor Relations. I will also be the host for today's event. A year has passed since our last Capital Markets Day here in London. Last year, the main theme was Fit for Growth Cost Savings Program. All right. And in the end of April this year, we presented you our sharpened growth strategy and announced new mid-term financial targets. Today, we will give you more details on how we are continuously going to improve our efficiency after the Fit for Growth program and how we are going to achieve the set growth targets. The program today is as usual, starting with the presentations and then followed by small group meetings. However, we have tried to be more focused when it comes to presentation and allowing more time for the discussion in the small group meetings. There is four small group meetings uh, or small, small group meeting teams and you will have a chance to attend each of the four, four meetings, each meeting lasting from 25 to 30 minutes. Obviously, we have reserved plenty of time for your questions after the presentations. The event will be webcasted, and those of you following us through the webcast, you can also send us questions. Or then you can follow us on the Camera Group Twitter. With this, I would like to welcome you to Capital Markets Day. I hope you find the day valuable. And before welcoming today's first presenter, Camera's President and CEO, Wolfgang Bühele, I would like to show a short video. Please show the video. The growing global population and scarcity of resources create a greater need to produce more with less. We make it possible by innovating together with water intensive industries. For the pulp and paper industries, sustainability means using water, energy and raw materials more efficiently. How do we achieve that? In packaging materials, our innovations enable the reduction and recycling of materials. With our strength and stiffness agent, Chemira Phenobond, our customers use less raw materials to manufacture lighter, more flexible and more durable board. In the oil and mining industries, the declining quality of reserves will require increased use of water for extraction. We use our understanding of extraction processes to tailor solutions for water management. Chemira Superflock polymers enable the concentration of solids in mine waste, which increases the amount of water that can be returned in the process. In the oil field, ChemFlow friction reducers optimize the reuse of water. Our scale inhibitors and biocides improve flow efficiency and asset integrity. The result, reduced need for surface fresh water and improved process efficiency. Our municipal and industrial customers have an increasing demand for water treatment. We focus on enhancing the energy efficiency of our customers' processes. We improve wastewater disinfection with Chemira Desinfix, our rapid, safe and chlorine-free disinfection method for water streams. All this is how we at Chemira enable water-intensive industries to improve their water, energy and raw material efficiency. We work closely with our customers to provide the most valuable expertise and tailored combinations of chemicals. We innovate together where water meets chemistry. Ladies and gentlemen, the last 12 months have been an exciting journey in the direction of Chimera to move towards a profitable, pure play in water quantity and quality management. We started off in summer last year with announcing our efficiency improvement program Fit for Growth, which just to recap, and you will hear more in the course of the day, to deliver on a run rate 60 million euros in saving in 2014, bringing us to an EB10 target 
which we are striving since quite some while. The next step in the transformation of the company was on October 1st, when we introduced as part of our strategic pillars the organization which had as a target to decentralize decision making by focusing on regional business units who run the business closer to the customer in a much more intense interaction with the customers. January 1st, we started with our performance management system where we established a value tree which breaks down corporate targets to individual targets for the white color people so that everybody knows exactly how and to what extent he or she can contribute and is expected, of course, to contribute to the overall performance of the company. And we accomplished that in a rather short period of time. We also adjusted, in line with the performance management system, our compensation structure to increase for most of our employees the variable compensation in order to incentivize them to go the extra mile. We then, in January, or at the end of January, divested our stake in Sachtleben, the challenging TIO2 business, which even today is now under new ownership in a not much better economical environment than it was at the beginning of the year. And I would still recap that we got a very decent price with 97 million. We clearly then finalized as a last strategic pillar our strategy, our sharpened strategy. In line with our guidance, we positioned Chimera as a company focusing on water quality and quantity management with paper and oil and mining having been earmarked as growth segments, whereas M&I, for reasons I explained at that time, and which are also attributable to the legislation in emerging markets, is currently earmarked to focus on mature markets with a strong request to improve profitability and maximize cash flow. And last but not least, Chem Solutions was also earmarked as cash generating business and at the same time was classified as non-core. We then, alongside these lines, also announced and guided you that going forward we will have a much stricter capital allocation. So we are focusing our capital in the direction of growing our differentiated products rather than focusing to a large extent on commodities which we did in the years before and I come to that later again too. The other step which happened in the first quarter was the divestment of our food and pharma business which was part of Chem Solutions and this was again I would suggest a very intelligent move and a very wise move because we found a buyer who has very high synergies and from that point of view, the multiple we could achieve for that business was excellent. We continued our journey with the announcement of 3F acquisition, an Italian polymer maker, and this company is ideally matching our strategic guidelines for M&A because it addresses gaps which we currently have in our portfolio. We also are at this point, and Michael Löffelmann, our senior vice president restructuring, who is also talking to you today, will give you more insight on that. We are also currently in the rollout of lean management, lean manufacturing as a company culture, which is striving for continuous improvement. So, as you can see, a lot has happened and we're still exciting to share with you what we plan to do and how we are taking the company forward. We have, in line with our sharpened strategy, meanwhile also redistributed the management of the various businesses. 
Effective September 1st, Petri Helsky, who is here today too, moved to Hong Kong because paper, the packaging and board and tissue market shows today the biggest growth in APEC and not in the mature markets anymore. And from that point of view, the business is driven going forward out of the most important market. In line with the fact that we have currently a market share which is in the very high double digit figures in the Nordic countries for paper, whereas in the continental European market, our market share is in the high single digit. We moved the European RBU for paper from Helsinki to Frankfurt in order to enable them to address the market where we are underrepresented in order to drive our market share and our growth there. Oil and mining is already historically and continues to be headed out of the US and in line with the strong and big coagulants market in Europe, in continental Europe, where we have also a very strong market position, we relocated the management of MNI from Helsinki also into Frankfurt. So we are now in the center of continental Europe in order to foster growth by a management from within the market rather than from a management that flies in and out. We are focusing in all our industries clearly on differentiated products. And what I would like to share with you here is that we could, based on differentiated products, improve our oil and mining presence over the last three quarters substantially. And we are today in oil and mining at a level that 82% of our portfolio is meanwhile made up by differentiated products. And we could improve our position even when you consider that the oil rigs were fairly stable, but the gas rigs were coming down quite substantially simply because there was an oversupply of gas. And if you recall, the gas price was collapsing in the middle of last year. Then the US gas price was recovering until roughly the end of April. And thereafter, due to oversupply, the gas price came down again. So from that point of view, oil and mining is moving in the right direction and is getting step by step back on track. The restructuring in MNI is also progressing well. And you were wondering when we had the Q2 result presentation, we were sharing with you that we had 3 million in consultancy fees, which the auditor didn't qualify as extraordinary items. They were linked to the next step of the MNI restructuring. And Frank Wegener will later on give you more insights on that. MNI, just to get that also right, is a large scale coagulants business, which is qualified as commodities. And the polymer business is largely a European business, our position in North America and in the emerging markets is much weaker. So from that point of view, the synergy between polymers and coagulants is our strong advantage in Europe. And again, Frank Wegener will give you an indication what we are doing there. What you can see is that from the low point in 2012, we could break the constant decline of the profitability and we are now back on the way up with this business and we are moving in the right direction. Therefore, from our today's perspective, we do not see any reason to change our guidance short and midterm. So that slide is well familiar to you and I just would like to reconfirm what we have discussed with you and what we have shared with you today and in various meetings before, we are striving in the direction of 2.6 to 2.7 billion in top line by 2016 with an EBITDA of 
And again, just as an explanation, we are switching from EB to EBDA because the chemical industry is using EBDA as a comparable and not the EBIT. And the corresponding EBIT figure is 11%, meaning that with the 10%, we don't think that the pure play chimera is at the end of what we are able to supply and what we are able to deliver. Our restructuring projects are ramping in quite nicely. We have currently two delays, and Michael will elaborate a little bit on that to a wider extent, and it's related to our two new installations, Dormagen, which is currently under startup, and Tarragona, where we had a delay due to the Roman ruins which have been found on the ground and which were analyzed by the archaeologists before we were entitled then to start construction. What is also currently quite positive for us is what we have said, the raw material price. The raw material price has come down. It's unfortunately now gradually starting to move up again. So the big uncertainty there is is something happening in Syria, yes or no? That is something we don't know yet, and that's the only unpredictable point what we see at the moment, because that would make the oil price jump, and then again, on the back of that, the propylene price will move quite drastically, rather quickly. That will not hit us this year, but it will ramp up then in the first quarter next year. Overall, that's how we look and that's how we analyze the future based on rolling assessments of various indicators. I would suggest the future currently, as we see it, looks fairly okay, except South America. I think that's something which you all are aware that the emerging economies are currently challenged with quite a number of issues and uh, the Brazilian situation is currently not really stable. And the other question is how is China moving forward? The overall growth anticipation for China has come down and the big question is what's going to happen there? But except that the overall future, how we see it currently, is looking fairly okay, and we are not expecting major disruptions anytime soon. I think that's a slide which you all have somehow on your mind when you try to look at the various communications you have received from us. What we've tried to do here is to build a bridge between the second quarter operative EBIT 2013 and an average quarter, and please, this is an average quarter because we have some seasonality, we've guided you on that, just to caution you that with the measures we have proposed and we have announced, we will get to the 10% EBIT return. So in this respect, we are well on track in delivering and from that point of view, we are currently fairly optimistic that Chimera is at full speed moving in the direction we want to move. We have basically fit for growth, the full run rate, bringing another 5 million. We have more or less uh, the one-off expenses in Q2, which we said, which are not repeating itself. We have the m and restructuring, which is a result of the consultancy fees we were showing in the second quarter. And it's the additional efficiency measures which are ramping in, meaning the VASA closure at the end of the year, the shared service center, which is currently starting up, and the first IT people have moved to Gdansk. And in October, we will then start with the first relocation of customer service from European centers into 
our new shared service center. And finally, uh, upon closing the 3F synergies, which you might recall we have quantified to be in the range of 10 million. So all that together is getting us in the direction of 10% EBIT return, and that's what we promised, and that's what we target for the company to achieve next year. We also had an ongoing discussion with you about fixed cost inflation, and fixed cost inflation is expected to be compensated by the constant improvement measures from within, and that is what lean manufacturing is all about, and that is why the rollout is well underway and the additional M&I turnaround measures which we have announced and where co-determination is currently ongoing, they will help us also to mitigate the inflation which we see in the range of around 2.5%. What is very important for us, what we changed immediately when the strategy was launched, is our capital allocation. What you can see here, and that's a slide we've shared with you already, is that historically in the period 2010 to 2012, we have invested 65% of our capex into commodity business business where we have limited differentiating power, if any, business where we have limited growth potential because we are not going to build new large-scale facilities, and only 35% have been invested into differentiated products. We are on the way to change that. Our target for 2016 is that 70% of our CapEx is going into differentiated products and only 30% are going into commodities with a clear focus to reduce manufacturing cost by improving manufacturing technologies. You will later on have the chance to also see, and he will introduce himself, our new CFO. He is at the same time the chairman of the investment committee and he's the guardian that the resources are allocated in the right way, and he will give a hard time to all the people who are asking for something different. So from that point of view, we also have put measures in place to make sure that this move is really taking place and that we are arriving where we want to arrive. We also have clear requirements with respect to return on investment, and that is that for normal line extensions, capacity, additions, etc., and existing sites, a payback of maximum five years is acceptable. And for grassroots investments, where you also have to build the infrastructure, obviously a slightly higher period has to be tolerated. And there we have said within max seven years, a grassroots investment has to pay back even that. We are planning that. By 2016, our capital demand is coming down to roughly 5% of our top line. We have, with 3F, started to be active on the acquisition market again. Chimera was absent for quite some while. We returned to the market with a clear target what we want to do. We have criteria which are mandatorily to be followed. A target needs to enable us to strengthen our market position, to close technological gaps we have, or to give us technologies which we would like to have and which we would see beneficial to our portfolio, which we don't have currently at our availability. This is the key criteria in selection, and then obviously the second criteria, which is important, that it must be EBITDA creative in the second year after closing. The 3F acquisition has met 
these criteria in an excellent way. We got backward integration into a key raw material which we currently buy from a competitor. We got tripolyacrylamide capacity in the United States, which we currently don't have, and therefore we could abolish a grassroot investment which otherwise uh, we would have undertaken and which would have given us capacity only at the end of 2016. So we are accelerating our strategic path with this acquisition by roughly three years. And last but not least, it also gives us additional capacity for a number of other products like BioAMD, which we currently also not have. Agril amide is the major raw material for most of our polymers. We are using currently a traditional copper catalyzed technology. The market is moving in the direction of a bio, meaning enzyme catalyzed process. And with 3F, we get bio AMD capacity in Europe as well as in the US. We have quantified our synergies with roughly 10 million and from that point of view, it was a nice piece and it's excellently fitting to our needs and we are currently working in the direction of closing the deal on October 1st and unless something very traumatic would happen, which I cannot see at this point, we will close and then immediately thereafter start the integration into Camera. Overall, we have currently a gearing which is around 36% and that means we have a headroom of some 280 million without violating our principles with respect to our balance sheet performance and without over leveraging the company. So from that point of view, we have a cushion where we are able, if nicely fitting targets become available, to also move and go for other additions to our portfolio if they meet the two criteria I've indicated to you. As usual, we always have a little bit more insight for you with respect to our portfolio. What we've done here is we have now basically broken down our segments with respect to what is the share of differentiated products versus commodities under consideration of the regional position the respective business has. And we have shown here revenue growth on the one hand over the last two years and the profitability of the business on the y-axis. Chem solutions, we are obviously, as you are aware, considering exit options because it's not strategic. And in the emerging market, APEC, oil and mining currently is still an opportunistic approach because the avenue for China has not really started and has not really become clear. Oil and mining in South America is already taking up much faster. There are currently strong focus on the oil and gas in Argentina and in Brazil and on the mining side, it's Peru and it's Chile. Still, from a growth perspective, it's very small and there is now room in line with the strategy to demonstrate accelerated growth. It's still for the time being a mixture of differentiated products and of commodities. M&I in South America is a rather challenging market. It's a commodity driven market and it's rather fragmented. So that's why the growth is rather low and the profitability is also low. M&I EMEA is again a mixture of differentiated products and coagulants because 
that is the only market where we have a real synergy between these two product groups and that's where the profitability of the M&I business is higher. In the United States or in NAFTA, the M&I business is a mere coagulants business and therefore in line with what I said before, profitability is lower and the growth is very much driven by the availability of byproducts which we take from other industries and which we then turn into coagulants. So you see basically from that slide where the strength of the portfolio is and where fields are where we are currently intensively working to improve the situation in order to improve the overall performance of the company. We have also discussed very intensely with respect to return on capital employed, so with respect to the balance sheet of the company, what we are driving towards 2016 is that we want to get the operative return on capital employed rolling 12 months in the direction of above 15%, which is much more in line with our peer groups in comparison to where we are today. We are, and you know that, and you've challenged me in this respect, we are with 10.4% currently in this respect more of the laggard of the industry than the leader. This has been identified and CapEx will help to get into the direction lean manufacturing and our SKU reduction program from a working capital perspective has already helped us to improve. We are now with 11.3%, around 2% lower than we were two years ago, and we want going forward to stay in a corridor of roughly 11 to 11.5%. And, and, of course, we will also increase our EBIT margin, our operative EBIT margin, alongside the fit for growth and our continuous improvement measures. So we are convinced that over the next three years, we are moving much closer in the direction where our peer group is today. And from that point of view, once we've gone in this direction, we are also from a return on capital employed where we as a profitable pure play should be. Another important field is organic growth. And I'm always excited when I see innovation examples and we will share a number of integration examples today by my colleagues. What you can see here is that immediately after the announcement of the strategy and in line with our strategy and our strategic orientation, we have started to rebalance our portfolio and in the scale-up phase as well as in the development phase, the majority of products clearly today is with paper and oil and mining. So we are focusing our innovation pipeline in the direction of where the growth segments are and Chem Solutions and m and these two segments where cash optimization and profit maximization are the drivers, have substantially less investment currently into the R&D pipeline. We have a technology management board in place to overlook the portfolio management and to make sure that the overall spending on R&D is going in the direction where we want to move the company and that our R&D portfolio is fully in line with our strategic long-term objectives. What you also can see from here is that we have quite a lot of things in oil and mining and paper which are hitting the market next year and a few things even still in the remainder of this year. And we also have quite a lot of projects in the pipeline which are currently under development moving towards commercialization. This is something where I'm getting very excited because these are two projects which we have defined as strategic projects for the company. The first on the left hand side, which looks a little bit futuristic, 
is a so-called microbial fuel cell. We are investing resources in order to develop the water treatment technology for the day after tomorrow. This technology will take approximately five years to hit the market, but it allows a decentralized plug-in solution for emerging markets where big concrete basins are not suitable because they cannot be retrofitted into the existing infrastructure. What's happening here is that you literally treat the wastewater by use of bacteria and at the same time produce electricity, which then ultimately can be released to the superior grid. With this, we are addressing two needs of emerging markets if this technology turns out to be selective and successful. We have the possibility to treat the wastewater in a decentralized approach and immediately return the electricity to the superior grid so we are also helping to address energy needs of the emerging markets. This is something which we feel is once the legislation in the emerging markets comes into play, a technology which is then available to be broadly launched and broadly brought to these regions. The other thing is something where we are intensively working on under the headline of control and monitoring. We've discussed quite some time ago about service models which some of our peer groups are applying to various industries. We all know that labor is getting ever more expensive and at the same time smart technology is making inroads and we are preparing and working on systems where we are able to remotely control installations, be it paper mills, be it wastewater treatment plants, and dispatch service technicians only on an as-need basis rather than having them constantly in the field. So that is our answer to some of our competitors and we feel that we can go live with that and consolidate our decentralized installations in approximately one and a half to two years from now. So you see that beside the projects you have from the segments, Chimera also has defined very limited but very relevant strategic R&D projects where we are looking from a corporate perspective what is a technology which might change the game, not today, not tomorrow, but in the future, and therefore with a different time horizon in contrast to where the segments typically are looking towards. We do that all with a solid financial background. We have refinanced Chimera's undrawn RCF roughly two weeks ago, and we have refinanced it with a new RCF which is 100 million euros bigger and has a reach of five plus one plus one year. So overall, under this facility, we are covered for the full strategic period of Chimera, and therefore, we are not expecting any challenges from a liquidity standpoint, no matter what happens, we are solidly financed. Covenants are okay. We have a gearing covenant, and that's not a big deal for us because we are, as I said before, we are not planning to over leverage the company. And from that point of view, that is a covenant we could easily live with. What you also can see is that our debt maturity profile is sound. So there is not a single year where we would suddenly be challenged with payback requirements, amortization requirements, which we would not be able to deliver and to honor. So from that point of view, also from an overall financial environment, Chimera is solidly financed and is stable. So from that point of view, we can follow our growth path also with the resources we might need. The dividend policy, which is very important for Finnish investors, is 
staying in place as you are aware of it and just to repeat we are intending to share and to distribute between 40 and 60 percent of Chimera's operative net profit. We exceeded that figure last year, so in 2013 we paid a slightly higher dividend than in line with the policy in order to demonstrate our confidence with the performance of the company going forward. But otherwise, you could see for the last years a very stable dividend return on a rather high or at the maximum level of our intended ratio. With this respect, Chimera is constantly above 4% dividend return and the dividend is a substantial part of our total shareholder return. At the end of my presentation, I would like to go back to the strategic roadmap. We are coming to the end of the redesign phase and at the same time we have started with the focus phase. The focus phase is now bringing Chimera into the direction of the pure play. Meaning, we are consolidating the, com the company into a pure play focusing on water quantity and quality management with the three pillars, paper, oil and mining, and municipal and industrial, so what you typically refer as the water treatment part of the business. We are clearly now driving to foster collaboration with our customers and to develop and implement the learning organization which is then the guarantor for further evolution within the company. And we want to achieve in our three target markets a sustainable position. 2015 to 17, the acceleration mode where we want to build a strong employer print and where we want to either gain or retain our leadership in the industrial areas which we have chosen. And we want to grow with new products and services and accelerate our expansion in emerging markets. We are anticipating that in this period, legislation on water in the emerging markets starts to ramp in, and not just on paper, but really also on an enforcement level. And last but not least, beyond the expand mode, we want to leverage what we have achieved by then and continue to grow the company in the direction of obviously then above 2.6, 2.7 billion. And you can think about what you would expect and you can share with me at any one time. With this, I would conclude my presentation and would like to welcome officially our new CFO, Patrick Strain, who joined us from Nokia Siemens Networks on September 1st. Pedri, right. welcome to the club. Thank you, welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, obviously, having just joined Chemera about a week or so ago, I must be somewhat careful with my regard, remarks on Chemera and its prospects. But nevertheless, uh, the issues that, we are, that I'm seeing and, and we're, we're dealing with are very general, how to find growth in today's economy, how to uh, improve profitability, how to look at, uh, look at costs, how to improve cash flow, and in general, utilize uh, the company's assets in the most efficient way. What I have found in Chemira, obviously, is it's a company with a lot of potential. It's middle of the redesign. It's, uh, for, it's middle of a transformation right now, and it will continue to... Uh, continue the transformation as it will focus uh, and deliver the focus, focus strategy. I believe that even as an outsider from, uh, to Chemira and, and new to the industry, I can bring a lot of the best practices that I have learned in my 17 years with Nokia and, and Nokia, Nokia Siemens networks. And, uh, and obviously, uh, communications industry and Nokia, I mean, recently has been a lot of negative press about Nokia, but it has gone through a lot of change. And personally, I'm very adept and, and, and accustomed to the change. 
have driven myself uh, significant change projects uh, during my times in, in Nokia and NSN, uh, just to name one. Uh, I personally led the negotiation team when NSN was created and when, when the Nokia Networks business was um, carved out from, the, from, the, from Nokia. During my time in NSN, NSN went through a significant transformation program. We often, talk, often see the headlines of headcount restructuring, but actually if you dig down deeper into what the NSN went through, even in global scale, it, it, certainly in European scale, it was a huge transformation that went through product portfolio, customer portfolio, looking at its global processes and all of that. And I believe that many of the lessons that I have learned during the NSN experience will be relevant as Camera is, is doing much of the same uh, here in, the, in right now and in the coming, coming years. In terms of uh, uh, what expect, uh, obviously beyond reporting uh, uh, financial numbers, both to external stakeholders and to internal stakeholders, uh, I see my role, uh, and Wolfgang uh, repeats itself nicely just a few minutes ago, as a very much of a, his a partner in driving the, uh, the performance culture within the company. So I see myself as really his partner in driving business performance, utilizing the assets, in investments, capex investments, etc. Et so um, uh, th that that I see as as my role. Personality-wise, I think you should expect to learn to, learn to know me as a no-nonsense uh, CFO, pragmatic one, I hope. And uh, with these words, uh, I like to conclude and, and look forward to working with all of you. Uh, and to supporting your investment decisions and investment, inform, providing you the necessary information that you need for your investment decisions and recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Petri and Wolfgang. Now it's time to take questions. And before asking, please wait for the microphone, state your name and company. Let's take the first question over there. My name is Theo Bal, I am Associates. Um, I have a question that um, affects, is, is directed to the two of you. Um, and I was wondering whether you could make any comments on the risk and risk provisions that Chimera is going to make in respect of the antitrust legislation, litigation in Finland, the Netherlands and Germany, um, especially considering the interim judgment reached in the district court in Helsinki and the settlement reached by um, Arkema with CDC. I would like to literally just refer to that we are not commenting on running cases. So obviously uh, there have been certain rulings and uh, <coughs> there was one ruling in Germany which has been referred to the European Court of Justice uh, which is related to whether the German court is competent in hearing the case and uh, obviously in Helsinki we are cooperating and uh, we have to see what's going to happen. The next question, over there in the middle. Ask on your uh, operative EBIT bridge, um, how much of a buffer you have for any variable cost inflation? So if raw materials track up through next year, um, how much you know, of a buffer from other cost cutting or pricing measures do you have that would offset that? And, um, and also, can I just confirm that your full year 13 targets uh, don't include any impact from the Q4 contribution from the business you've just acquired? Uh, let's put it that way. First of all, we are going forward on the basis of the assumption that if raw material prices increase, we can literally pass them through with a three months delay. And if that happens now that we hit the first time the wall, so to speak, in the first quarter, then obviously we have some buffer to make up for that. That's why I'm, I'm rather careful that this is something which I would suggest we can cope with 
and I'm not expecting that this will lead to an undercut of our 10% EBIT. And obviously, uh, there is some buffer also coming from 3F, but there I would like to caution you, because obviously, as we said, EBIT aggregative only in year two, so you anyway should not expect from an acquisition a lot of upside in the first year. Thanks. Any further questions? If not, I would like to welcome. Oh, there's one more question. Okay. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Tim from uh, for Koku Life. <clears throat> you say you've got a, the three month delay on the, the commodity prices since about 2009. You've had some sort of margin erosion because of that. And what's changed there that you can now pass through prices where you haven't always been able to? If you look to our pass-through pattern, and we have guided a couple of times on that, if you have constant steady moves in cycles, then when the price moves up, we are with typically a three-month delay for the polymers and up to six months delay for the coagulants due to contractual situation, we are able to pass through the raw material in in increase. We have, in the very beginning, when the onset takes on, we have some margin squeeze, and then when the cycle turns, the prices go down again, then we get the margin expansion again. The challenge for us is when the prices start to fluctuate, because then we typically take hits. Because then you have the constant discussion is the price now moving or is the price just coming back again? And that is where customers have the biggest resistance to accept price increases. So fluctuating raw materials are the most challenging, challenging to us. Okay, so is that a three month average through the cycle? That That's for the I'm polymers, saying? for the polymers three months. And if you have coagulant raw materials, due to the, 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 the contractual situation with the municipalities where we have annual contracts, it's statistically six months. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Arte Beleski, a uh, question regarding your 2016 revenue target of 2.6 to 2.7 billion euros. Uh, when we look at uh, transactions, what what you have been doing and <clears throat> planning to do, so basically, basically 3F and also game solutions. So there, there will be presumably quite some MTI impact on this revenue target. So could you maybe maybe talk about organic growth? What kind of expectations you are putting there, uh, looking at this long-term target? Well, obviously, uh, when we divest something like Chem Solutions. We, with a high likelihood, are trying to reacquire more or less the same value of top line. And then you can literally see, we have guided that our organic growth, on average, going forward, should be at least 4%. And then you can basically do the math by yourself, uh, how much is inorganic and how much is organic. 4% is our target, at least for organic growth going forward. And that's what we have guided also when we presented the strategy. Thank you. Uh, uh, you mentioned M&A, uh, and um, uh, would you be willing to, to look at some bigger acquisitions as well? And temporarily, perhaps, uh, go beyond your, your targets in terms of gearing. For example, uh, there might be some bigger assets out for sale right now. Is that something you would be interested in looking at, or, or are you totally kind of focused on making smaller Bolton acquisitions? I think we guide it very clearly on where we are looking and what we are focusing on. Got it. Thank you. And if there's a question in the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Ben Scarlett from JP Morgan. 
maybe not the best point in the day to ask this, and maybe it's something that will be addressed later, but you're talking about R&D and heavy, heavy expenditure in oil and mining. Could you remind us how it is that you differentiate yourself in this market in what is a very competitive market from a, from a high level, maybe? Well, I think, uh, obviously, we have very solid competitors, and we are trying to provide to the market not the large volume commodities which companies like SNF and BASF can deliver much better. We are focusing ourselves on differentiated technology which is very important for the efficiency of production be it oil, be it gas. And you will later on in the R&D part see an example of that. What this type of differentiating product is, it's smaller in volume but it's more intelligent from a technological perspective and it's more aspirational in this respect and it gives and makes the difference for the operator of the well. Thank you. Maybe one more question. Hi, thanks, Fabio Lopez from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. In terms of the restructuring program, what has been the biggest challenge in terms of implementation so far, in terms of regions or in terms of um, product line or in terms of the, any developments that you would like to talk about? I give you an answer which you find in every change management book. It's the middle management of the company. Not more, not less. This is where the biggest challenge is when, you come, when it comes to restructuring because the middle management is afraid that they are losing out and they are trying to resist. And it takes quite some time to get them on board and once this has been achieved, then the car is running smoothly. I think we are advanced quite well. There are still the one another, and Michael will refer to that, the stronghold which we have to crack we openly admit that, but in general, we advance quite well. But this is, this is where it really comes down to. And this is why I guided in the past, yes, Chimera has not the best history in diligent implementation, but we have improved, and I think the track record what we shared with you demonstrates that. We have improved dramatically, but it's about getting the middle management on board. I'll just take one final question over there. Yes, Marko Arven, Evli. Um, just wanted to ask you about your 15% ROC target. You mentioned that you see lower goodwill in 2016, while you also expect to do acquisitions. Um, should we expect um, write downs, or um, what's the sort of uh, how do you expect to achieve lower goodwill? For example, why a divestment? And when we acquire something, we have the clear intention not to overpay. So uh, with uh, 3F, do we need to expect that there is no goodwill involved? Or? I think the purchase price allocation has not yet been made. That's something the CFO is going to do very soon but I think he will do it in a diligent way. I think it's clear, clearly that we need to be careful in how to allocate purchase price in, in the future. So how much is actually parked in the goodwill account and how much is actually allocated to the depreciable assets. And I think that, that, that logic is part of the underlying theme in that statement. And this is where I'm expecting also due to his past experience a very positive impact of Patrick Castrain to help us to get that part of our balance sheet in a better shape. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for the questions. It's time to introduce the next presenter. Thank you, Wolfgang and Petri. Also another new member in the family, Senior Vice President Restructuring, Mihail Lothelman. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Taro. Thanks for the kind introduction. As already mentioned, my name is Michael Löffelmann. I am the new vice, senior vice president restructuring. 
And I think my job title describes my focus area quite well, so no need to elaborate further on this. Um, increased focus on efficiency on savings. I think also that title um, sets the scene quite well for the minutes to come. I would like to tell you a little bit more what we are planning to do and what we already have started to do with Inkemira to have that higher increased focus on savings and efficiency. Before I come to that, I first would like to, I think, maybe answer the most burning question, at least related to this topic among the audience, and that is what is the status of Fit for Growth. Um, fit for Growth target 2014, 60 million euro. For this year, 2013, the target is 50 million euro. Um, when I started after Q2 or in Q2 my job, I did a, also a review of all the ongoing savings measures. What is the status there? How we feel comfortable with the implementation? So first of all, the message is for 2014, I'm very confident that we will get the 60 million euro. However, in 2013, we experience some delays in the implementation, especially when we consider, for instance, here the Dormagen and the Tarragona case. And that, and all these delays basically, cause us now a delay in the phasing of the savings, and that means we will not get the 50 million euro, we will get minimum 45 million euro plus X. Now you might ask yourself, why do I say plus X? The reason is simply we will launch now additional mitigation actions, additional savings measures in order to make up that gap that would cause to the delayed phasing. And with that, at least, I'm very confident that we get the 60 million euro and we will get next year and we will get something this year also. But before I now waste time on evaluating these measures, I simply go for it and implement it and then see what I will get in this year. That's why I simply have to say here 45 plus X in some kind of gray area. Um, about these mitigation actions, I will tell you later some details. Um, one major thing that you heard now many times is lean. Um, I think you, own, you haven't heard it only related to Chimero, you have heard it to, related to a, a lot of different industries, and I don't know how familiar you are with lean. So let's take just a one or two minute breakout session in lean. Um, Lean basically is perceived to date back or be related to the Toyota production system. Why was Toyota so much focusing on efficiency? Quite easy, after the Second World War, there were shortage in resources everywhere in Japan. No manpower, no utilities, no raw materials, nothing. That means they had to do all of their products really in the most efficient way in, a, in order to be able to be competitive. And from that, basically, all these lean management principles were derived. However, if you look further back in history, let's take the Fort in Lizzie, even there you find lean principles applied. If you go even further a couple of centuries, go to the shipyards of Venice, the arsenal in the 16th century, even there applied lean principles. And with the standardization of the ship production, every ship was built the same. They were able to beat uh, to build one trading vessel each day in the 16th century. Um, and by the way, the Fort in Lizzie was not black because it was the cheapest color, it was the quickest drying color. That's why it was black, for instance. Um, now, what does that mean for us? Basically, the major credo of Lean is creating customer value without waste. That's a nice sentence, and that's very generic, I have to admit that. Um, if you go now to lean production, for instance, lean production, we have basically seven kinds of wastes. Let me just give you a few examples. For instance, idle or waiting time. We have a lot of batch processes. If the cleaning time, the filling time of batch reactors, that's idle or waiting time. If you work on that, you can increase your capacity, you can increase your throughput, and you therefore can increase also your efficiency. Another thing, for instance, is um, high inventories not only the typical networking capital aspect, but also if you talk about batch processes again, if your cycle times and the different steps are not adjusted and you don't have the process flow, which is also a target of lean, you have to buffer these deficiencies by intermediate storages. Another example is unnecessary transportation, unnecessary movements, deficient products and repair, all these kinds of waste. Was that something new that I told you? No, definitely not. You have that in all of the industries, and that's also nothing new. The new thing about that is 
that Lean provides a very standardized tool set that you really identify that in a very yeah, repetitive way and really you can drill it down to the shop floor so that even the forklift driver starts to think how he can optimize his transportation routes. And that is here the trick because you all do lean in your life. If you take, for instance, the waste unnecessary movements, look at your desk. The things you need most are in the top drawer, at least they should be. And the things you need least, they are in the lowest. And then you avoid unnecessary movements. That's now nothing new, but this is a structure that keeps then banging to your brain. Really, I have to review everything every day. And that is basically what Lean is for us about. The second major credo after creating customer value without waste, that's basically the current state is always the worst. So that means with Lean, you simply leave that typical, and I come from that, the typical restructuring project approach behind. Because normally you do a project, now we are optimized, now we are fine. But with Lean you always say, okay, now we did something, but still we have not achieved the best. So it's that constant drive, that constant or continuous improvement process that is going to initiate it by Lean. And that is what we need. Because you have heard we have a lot of sites, we have a lot of SKUs, we have complex organizations, we try to streamline our processes, we are very complex. And Lean helps us in all of these aspects to reduce the complexity, to reduce our costs and then basically increase our competitiveness. And with that basically we want to offset then later the, fixed, the inflation of the fixed cost base for Chimera. That's basically what Lean is for us about. Overall, Lean is not a rocket science. It's just really about getting it continuously, stringently, really implemented and focused on it every day. Having talked about Lean in principle, um, we have started, of course, to roll out Lean. We focus currently on the EMEA region. Um, we have first, our goal was to standardize the organiz organizational structure of our sites. We have picked three sites, that's Botleck, Rheinberg and Helsingborg, three different sites, three different sizes of sites, and we have defined blueprint organizational structures for these kind of sites, and we are currently rolling that out to all other sites in the EMEA region. Goal is here to have standard interfaces, standard organizational structures, and then standard processes in the site. Of course, while we were doing that, we also of course, we're looking for, do we find some of these typical low-hanging fruits? And this is what you see basically on this chart. So these savings that you see here, these measures have already implemented, and by end of 2013, we have that 6 million in. Um, Helsingborg, for instance, that is the biggest site that we have in Chimera. Um, for instance, we did an insourcing of maintenance workers. We saved 600,000 euro. We renegotiated the maintenance contract, the transactional prices there, 500,000 euro. We adjusted the shift plan in three plants, 300,000 euro. We, for instance, also reduced the laboratory analysis, 50,000 euro. So we found a lot of things there. Um, in Bradford, for instance, the major contribution was substituting one raw material with a cheaper one that was already 300,000 euro. Um, in Botleck, we reduced the analysis, the laboratory analysis, and the corresponding staff. That was approximately 100,000 euro. We optimized, and that's the idle of waiting time, we optimized the cleaning of the EPAM reactors. That's 150,000 euros. So we find a lot of examples here. Um, now just please do me one favor and don't do the typical scale-up approach and multiply these savings with the number of sites that we have. As I said, we are very complex. We have very big sites, Helsingborg, and we have very small sites. Um, we have different operational modes. We have different products. Even if we have the same products, we have different production technology. And that means the typical scale-up approach, unfortunately, doesn't work here. Um, and that really means also we have to go to each site and see what we will find there. Um, however, this is just the quick win phase, I would say. The major goal is first to get the lean culture implemented and running and to get it really to a self-fulfilling philosophy there. Yeah. I mentioned before that we will launch additional savings mitigation actions. A major contribution in the savings mitigation actions will be lean standardized modules, savings modules. What does that mean now? 
Um, basically, if we're looking at the observations that we did in the pilot phase, and if I look also back at the experience from previous jobs that I collected, we have identified at least five areas where we can say, A, they are applicable to a major share of the sites, B, they will bear sufficient improvement potential, and C, they can be implemented, implemented more or less quite quickly. Um, now let me give you one example for weighing and filling. In many of our sites, we do packaging of products. The biggest package starts basically at IBC or big bag level from one ton going down to the 25 kilogram paper sack um, or even smaller to a can. All of these packaging types are basically filled by gravimetric dosing and are promised or are sold by a promised weight, like you buy the butter or milk in the supermarket. In many times, we do a slight overfill of this packaging in order to avoid any customer claims and to be really on the safe side, so we just give some product away for free. Um, we did an analysis at Bradford. Bradford, we have basically four big bag filling lines. We measured there an average overfill of 4.5 kilograms. If you do the math with the um, big bags that we sold last year from there, 26,000. So 26,000 times the 4.5 kilogram, average product price, 3 euro, you get 350,000 euro savings, implemented just by an adjustment of the filling station within one day. Um, at Krems, we did the same thing. IBCs, we sell basically, or we sold 2012, 8,500 IBCs from Krems. Average overfill, 2.5 kilogram. Average product price, 2.65 euro per kilogram. More than 50,000 euro savings, easily identified. So that is one of our core modules that we will roll out now simultaneously to all sites as one of the mitigation actions. Another one is, for instance, the material handling benchmark. In many of the sites, we have external services engaged to do basically our raw material, our finished products, or intermediate handling. And we pay a lot of them uh, for them. Helsingborg, I think we have 900,000 euros spent. At Krems, we have a 200,000 euros spent. But what we do now is a cross-site benchmarking of these services, which is sometimes a little bit tricky because the contracts are, of course, not the same. Um, but we did some analysis, for instance, in Helsingborg, we pay on average €2.50 for getting one ton product up on a, on a truck. In Krems, we pay €4.20. So basically, if we have that um, benchmark available, we can tell the site managers where they are in terms of their cost position, and then they can renegotiate basically that contract, also quite quickly implemented. Another thing is the lean lab or in-process analysis. Um, each plant has a defined in-process analysis plan, which basically says at which location, at which time, and how often I have to take samples and analyze um, certain measurements. Normally, this analysis plan is made up at the startup of a plant, and after several years, when the plant is much more stable, it is hardly revised. That means you find in that analysis plan measurements that are measured once or twice a day that are within the specification for several years. Um, so no need to measure them anymore. Um, you also find um, a lot of measurements that are done three or four times a day, um, never out of specification, so why not reducing it and just doing it once a day? You also find measurements where you have the, pros or the result available after eight or ten hours, and your plant is already at a complete diff different operational point. So why do I measure that? Um, I have done that exercise at the previous company, um, and you find there are a lot of measurements that you can reduce. And even within Helsingborg um, and also in Botleck, some of these results are already in the savings in. So also that we will roll out to all the plants. Self-loading is another thing that we will roll out. Um, we have on most of our side a lot of liquid products and also liquid raw materials that enter or leave the site by truck. The trucks have to be loaded or unloaded. Funny thing is, in some sites, the truck drivers are doing that. In other sites, Chimera employees are doing that. So why not looking at that and see, we have to get to the goal or to the state that all truck drivers do simply the discharge or charging of the trucks. And we simply then can free up time of our operators. They can do other uh, services where we normally have to pay for, and then we save some money if we free up free up a lot of resources, we might have to adjust the staffing. 
That's the fourth one. The fifth one are remote operators. I don't know how many of you have ever been to a chemical plant in a control room, but basically you see there are always one or two persons sitting in front of monitors and just pushing some buttons. And in many times they're not doing anything. Um, we have implemented at one plant in Bradford that basically the operators get handhelds. So the alarms, if some deficiencies in the, in the production process happen, are displayed on their handhelds. That means they can leave the control room, go out to the plant, do preventive maintenance tasks, do cleanup tasks, and we save them basically the external spend for that. So that is also something that we want to implement at other plants. If you look now, of course, here from the left to the right, um, you basically see that the more we go to the right, the more EHS comes into that game. And that means we cannot implement it so quickly as, as we want, um, especially when we come to remote operators and self-loading. We need to train the truck drivers. We, um, we need to assess really for which chemicals they can do it or they can't do it. Um, and that means in the first rollout of these mitigation actions, we focus on module one and module two. Um, and basically, we initiate that currently. And that is basically one of the major share of these additional mitigation actions. And that is the reason also why I can only say 45 million plus X, but not an exact figure. Simply also because due to our complexity, not all plants are the same. So we don't know how much savings potential we will find at each plant in advance. Um, having talked about the additional savings actions and having talked about before the delay of something, I think one major thing is also that we are very good on agreeing on new targets. We are very good on um, identifying new areas for improvement, but really bringing these improvements home is a different story. And that is something we really must improve within Chimera. And that means really we must create a higher sense of urgency among the employees to really get the things done in the required time. Of course, some pressure from the top management is always helpful in order to do that. But on the other hand, you also need to provide additional resources and the right tools for the people that they are really able to do that. If we look at resources, we are currently building up an own lean department. We recruit internally lean experts they will do that job for two to three years. They get additional lean training. They will focus on bigger lean projects, be the ambassadors of lean on the site, support the sites in the lean rollout, and then after two to three years, they go back to operation, potentially rewarded with a higher position. And then we get the next lean experts on board. In addition, we will also hire a lean director externally, someone who comes from a strong lean background, someone who knows how a site should look like once you have lean culture up and running there, someone who is really in command of all the methodologies and tools. So that means also we buy now external know-how in order really to be able to do the whole rollout or the final implementation of lean on our own without any further external support. Another thing is we are currently in the hiring phase of manufacturing network optimization task force. These will be two people simply focusing on the manufacturing network optimization. That means further streamlining, of course, our number of sites. And of course, there's also my person who will also, and I will engage myself much more closer in the follow-up of the implementation that we do not run into that delayed um, implementation again. In terms of tools and trainings, we, for instance, have provided now a lean online assistant training for all our employees on site. That means 600 online trainings for all the employees in the EMEA region. Um, we even have provided lean training to the top management. We have provided lean training, additional lean trainings to sites wherever they requested it. Um, we provide on SharePoint now standardized lean tools, standardized templates for lean that they should um, also apply. So even the rollout is done in a standardized way. And that is really, re really here the key. Um, and that means really also in terms of tracking all the savings measures that we identify, we come now to a point not only tracking the financial success of those, but also the actions. Are we really in time in the implementation? to hear the alarm signal earlier um, than before if we get into a delayed implementation. 
with all these measures, basically, we want to come to a really high performance driven culture. We really want to get that continuous improvement process really implemented and running at Chimera. But of course, I mentioned now the word culture, and that means we do not talk here about a restructuring project anymore. We talk about implementing a new culture. And that's something that doesn't go overnight. That requires some time, discipline, and patience. And that means at least three years till we have that full lean culture really implemented in Chimera. Thanks. And then basically, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Frank Wigner, President, Municipal and Industrial. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. With the implementation of Fit for Growth, actually the turn of the profitability to the better side started, as you can see here on the slide. Um, if you compare Q1 2012 with Q1 2013 and take Q2, in addition to that, you can see the, um, the way up. However, having said that, our target is to get to an EBIT margin of 10 percent. And uh, to get to this EBIT margin of 10 percent in municipal and industrial, it was rather clear that we have to define certain new measures, um, which takes us to the target. We have taken some time now. I have taken over that position in May this year to define additional targets. And as you can see here on the slide, we have found certain measures to get to additional uh, savings, which are accounting to more than 5 million. Um, basically, the core of these measures are in the organization and in customer segmentation. I will shed, in the course of my presentation, some more light on that and um, <clears throat> you know, getting more granular on that. Further benefit we are expecting from um, Met manufacturing network optimization, Michael Löffelmann has elaborated on that. And just to, to put you into picture, especially for coagulants plant manufacturing network organ, uh, optimization is an important topic. Whereas, to stay with the example, yesterday you could produce coagulants out of virgin raw materials. This is today already challenging. Tomorrow it will be virtually impossible on the basis of ever-increasing availability of industrial byproducts, such as hydrochloric acid, for, for example, from isocyanate processes. And to stay with the example, um, our new facility in Dormang, which is about to start up, is built on the back of a big uh, isocyanate production, and we get, are getting <coughs> hydrochloric acid on site by pipeline from such a producer. This leads me to the next slide. Um, Staying with the coagulant part, especially with the coagulant business in the emerging areas, we are facing difficulties. We are facing competitive challenges. Um, our competitors, especially in coagulants in the emerging markets, are typically small players, very local players, with different business drivers, but also with different margin ambitions. And you can imagine with our cost structure, with our you know, way to approach profitability, it's very hard to compete in, um, in, these, uh, in this area. Um, I can give you also the, uh, the answer to those challenges. Our focus in the future will be pretty much on Europe and on NAFTA, so on the mature markets. The emerging markets will be important, especially Asia-Pacific will be important. We will keep a foothold, especially in Asia-Pacific, because these are the growth markets um, of the future. And um, <clears throat> Wolfgang has already shed some light on that. Once the enforcement of the legislation allows us, we will be there with a broader presence. I mentioned in the first slide that um, we were looking intensively into the organization and uh, we, we found opportunities to streamline the organization in specific ways. So far, we have been looking at our, to stay with, with Europe in this case, we have been looking at our um, business in a, if you want to name it like that, one jacket fits all approach. So we have differentiated um, <clears throat> business in Europe, in municipal and industrial, and we have a big part of commodity business, namely coagulant business in, 
in uh, municipal and industrial. And as I said before, we have been pretty much serving the customers um, in both, you know, of, of both kinds in the same way. Um, we will not do that in the future, and uh, the next slide uh, will, will show you how we will move forward with that. Um, we have been also pretty much using, wherever possible, uh, our own resources to serve the end customers. And especially if you, again, look at the commodity bulk coagulant business which we are running in most of the parts in Europe, it's very difficult to imagine that we can serve small customers, for example, with container business, in, with the same cost structure as, uh, as our distributors, meaning our channel partners, can do. So moving forward, we will pretty much look at the opportunity to use our channel partners increasingly to also serve this business, which is attractive business, but not attractive business from our perspective in terms of uh, the direct handling. Um, we will also, and we have look, looked at our stock keeping units, a thousand stock, keep, stock keeping units, sorry, um, for a business as we are running in municipal industrial is definitely too much. So we will cut by half by the end of the year and we will look further for improvement options because even that number of stock keeping units is too high for that business. Having said all that, um, you will certainly be interested what is the result of that. And we have identified about 50 headcounts which can be reduced in our business to safeguard um, sustainable, compet sustainable competitive situation in municipal and industrial. Looking now at, at one major and important key of our reorganization, um, we, have, we, we have started from the approach, we have about 9,000 customers in MNI in Europe. These 9,000 customers are roughly classified to a half, um, which are buying on price and purely, purely on price. Those customers do not pay for service. Those customers do typically also not pay for tailored, for tailored uh, products. And we have about uh, the other half of um, our customers who are indeed paying for certain uh, service items like um, fast time to resolution or in some cases technical support. But also we, we have some customers who really value if we are tailoring a product for them if they have a very specific problem. So as I said before, this one jacket fits all approach was something which we have questioned. In the future, we will cluster our group of salespeople we have in Europe into two parts. One part is pretty much focusing on those customers which are only paying, which are only uh, buying on price. So these salespeople, uh, to be very concrete, they will be working from the offices. They will be working basically by email and by telephone, and they will be hardly traveling to the customers because, again, those customers do not pay for any service. In this field, we have a lot of municipal customers where the tender business is located. So handling the tender documentation is quite a, you know, labor-intensive and time-intensive action, but needs to be done if you want to stay in the business. But we, in the future, we will concentrate, we will centralize those um, services, we will centralize those activities, and we will make sure that we handle those customers who, again, are not paying for any service. They will be served in the most efficient way. The other group of people will be concentrating on the value and performance buyer, as we call them. Um, we have, as I said before, we have a lot of differentiated business herein. Um, and that's also the reason why we have uh, decided to put the technical support into those uh, sales and marketing, into those sales group in particular. Um, <clears throat> so these people will be focusing on creating, together with our customers, the right value that our service is valued and paid in the future.
our manufacturing network has been streamlined already. So we have defined um, several sites which are up for closure. Six of them have been already closed. Um, four, two production sites and two um, plants will be closed in the course of the next few months. Um, <clears throat> Once the, our door marking site is fully in production, which is expected, uh, startup is, is uh, in a process right now. The, uh, the full, full ramp up will, will take a few weeks, but certainly in the fourth quarter, this production will be fully up and running. And uh, in the course of this ramp up, we will close uh, one plant and one site uh, according to plan. The same will basically happen with Tarragona in the first quarter of next year. Um, on the back of the startup in Tarragona, Spain, we will close uh, one site and one plant. And this has been something which has been, this, this is something which has been communicated to you. The further network, manufacturing network uh, optimization will be on the table, but Michael Löffelmann uh, was, was elaborating on that. Um, we will implement a new culture, and this culture will not only focus on this buzzword lean, but, but will focus also um, in, in general on constant optimization, on, on continuous improvement. And again, um, the world is changing quickly. Further manufacturing network optimization is key to a sustainable future and, um, and will be part of our everyday life, and the same we are expecting to see in North America. The legislation around clean water is basically the essence of our business. We will look into sludge treatment, especially in Europe, but also in other geographies, once the 3F acquisition is fully done um, with full forces because once the 3F acquisition is done, we have all the ingredients together to participate to this fastly growing market. Sludge dewatering is becoming a very, um, you know, demanded topic um, and, and is an application which is growing with about 5%, even in a mature um, region like Europe. In China, in particular, everybody expects that about 50 billion will be invested in during the next five years. The only challenge at this point in time is that only 7% of these funds are available at this point in time. So we are expecting that the uptake, the, the uh, evolution will take place, that these funds will be available pretty soon. And once they are available, we are in this uh, geography there in order to ramp up our activities. Well, let me close my presentation with a summary of our planned action over and on top what we have already communicated to you, which was um, in, in the program Fit for Growth. We have found further methods to streamline our business and to materialize on our new role being the cash provider for the Chimera Group and having said that, especially for the growth segments. Um, we have been identifying measures to improve structurally our profitability. Reduction of complexity will be something which will accompany us now, from now on. And customer segmentation and organizational optimization has led to additional savings potential, with, which I have um, laid out. We will focus on mature market, but clearly due to the expectation that the enforcement of the legislation, the respective legislation in Asia Pacific, especially in China, is coming up. We will keep an active foothold in Asia Pacific to be there when necessary. And last but not least, our R&D focus has changed. We are focusing on our production processes to safeguard the fact that our production technology has to be competitive. We are focusing on a few new products. And we are focusing on application development. In those applications, 
which are prospectful enough to support our growth targets for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Let's take questions. Starting in the middle. <coughs> Oliver Reef, Deutsche Bank. Uh, can I ask on the plant closures, how many of the benefits of those are actually visible on, on the P&L as of Q2 and how many do we actually still have to see in Q3 and Q4 of this year? Well, in the plant closures, basically in Fit for Growth, the target was for uh, site closures to get 20 million euro savings in out of the total 60 million euro. As um, we have elaborated, we have a delay of the, two, uh, of the site closures due to Dolmagen and Tarragona. And basically, these delays are responsible for a monthly run rate of 0 0.5 million euro. And basically, with that, I think you can do part of the math. I don't have the exact figures in mind. Thanks. One quick follow-up question. Well, once the re regulatory ramp starts to pick up in China... Will you purchase coagulant from local producers and add uh, your polymer and know-how, or will you likely start up a new site or acquire a company? Personally, I do not believe that in the coagulant market in China we will be competitive. The growth will be basically on the back of differentiated products, and as I have outlined here, um, Especially the 3F acquisition is giving us the tools to effectively uh, compete in the market. Not as such, only with the 3F acquisition we have to take certain other measures, but the technology basically connected to the 3F acquisition is able to, you know, safeguard us uh, an access to, to the market. But it's not, it's not commodities. That's very clear. Thanks. Panulaiti Mäki, Danske Bank. Uh, I have a question on this lean implementation. So what's your view um, where your competition is now uh, with this? So when you are done with, the, with most of the things that you mentioned, do you think it will put you ahead of the competition or uh, just uh, on par of what they are already doing? Well, if you look at some competitors, they are focused or started to focus on lean much more earlier. For instance, at Lanxess or at BSF, you have dedicated forces for lean. We are currently, let's say, picking that up. That's definitely one thing. Um, some others have not started that, but I think we are at least just picking up the pace with some of the co competitors here. Thanks. Fabio Lopez, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Um, I think this is for Michael. These two new uh, people that you're hiring for the manufacturing, manufacturing integration. What, what's their background? And they'll report to you or they'll be part of the segments? No, they, they report to me directly. And basically the, the desired background is a combination of consulting and a combination of operational experience, especially in chemical um, industry. So that's basically the desired profile that we are looking for here because you need to do now much more a profile analysis and data gathering because let's say the quick wins or the easy targets have been identified and now it gets more tricky. You need to consider the supply demand envelope, the future strategy, the production technology itself and then you have much more variables in that system and that's why also one emphasis is for me I want to have people at least engineering or natural science degree, not economists um, and basically people with consulting background that are also used to do quite painful analysis. Clear. Thanks. Yes, Christian Stiefel from Morgan Stanley. A question to Frank. Um, you basically expect uh, M&I uh, market growth to be around 3% from 12 to 16. Can you maybe share with us and how far you intend to outperform that market also in light of your two, uh, like 2016 sales growth target? Thank you. Well, first, first of all, I, I, I clearly must say that the... Um, Restructuring of, or restoring of the profitability is target number one. Um, definitely, uh, not only in Asia Pacific and in, in um, 
especially in China, the target is to grow with differentiated products. We can also grow with coagulants, but since the market is not growing, that will not be an organic uh, growth in the emerging market, in, in the mature market, sorry, which is our focus area. So growth will take place, and I'm, well, obviously not want to go more, more granular here, um, but it will be taking place basically on the back of uh, uh, differentiated products, meaning, for example, in those applications like sludge dewatering. There will be growth, but profitability first. Can I ask how you see the competitive environment for municipal uh, contracts developing? Do you see are you, are any of your comp competitors struggling at all or are they becoming more aggressive? Well, we see, we see the, the overall competitive environment in the mature market, um, you know, getting tougher um, day by day. And we are also seeing that the, the uh, margin, the profitability aspiration of our competitors are sometimes not met. We are the ones in Europe with the highest market share. And um, it's, you know, we are, and, and, and that's why I elaborated pretty much on the manufacturing network optimization. We are basically forced to think about what are the next steps, you know, with rapidly growing availability of these byproducts, which I mentioned. This was only one example. There are other industrial byproducts as well, which can be used for the production. So this is basically driving the show. And the ones who are the fastest here and can follow these uh, development of industrial byproducts, they will be then staying in the market and they will be competitive. So it's not easy to, to, to answer this, this question in a straightforward way, but our competitors are facing the same situation as we are facing. But we are having the market share in Europe, for example, with more than 30%, so we are um, catching up. All right, thank you very much. I think it's now time to have a break before the innovation presentation. Uh, I suggest some 15 minutes Let's be back here half past two and start the innovation presentation then. Thank you.
All right, welcome back. Next presentation is about innovation. As you can see on the slides, innovation being our main organic growth driver. And I would like to welcome Heidi Fagerholm, CTO of R&D. Please go ahead. Thank you, Tero. So welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to guide you through the journey of uh, research and development, how we are supposed, uh, supporting the organic growth of Kemira. First, to start with, a few, few facts of our R&D research center network. We have four centers and altogether about 250 persons working within the research and development. Each of the centers have a dual role. So they are supporting the regional business in terms of providing technical customer support and production support <coughs> for the business and for the production units. But apart from that, they have their own competence and specialty areas where they have the responsibility for developing new products. We have specified what we call an NPD, a new product development process, and that is running up and running in each of the centers according to a stage gate model. Uh, during the last, let's say, 12 to 18 months, we have done a lot of work of aligning our R&D portfolio, our project portfolio, to meet the strategy. So the focus of the portfolio or the projects in the portfolio is, is on the growth segments supporting the paper and the oil and mining growth. You saw already in, in Wolfgang's presentation that there are some projects in the chem solutions and in the MSI, especially focusing on the manufacturing process development. Uh, we have a target to increase our portfolio value by 50% by 2020. And what we mean by the portfolio value, that's the sum of all projects or of all projects net present value in uh, currently <coughs> ongoing in the portfolio. We want to increase our uh, cross-regional participation in the R&D projects. And by this, I mean that we will bring people from our Shanghai R&D center with a specific knowledge on the market needs of, for example, tissue in APAC. We will bring polymer chemists from our Atlanta R&D center with a specific knowledge on how to develop uh, and apply polymers. And we will bring people together from ESPO with their uh, specific knowledge in the paper and the paper development. And these groups together will form cross-regional R&D projects. And this is something that we want to further increase. Already one third of our projects are cross, let's say, projects, having people uh, from more than just one center. So this is taking really the global approach, but matching it with the regional needs and utilizing the skills and competencies in our network. Every second of our project has an external research partner. So we actively collaborate with academia, with SMEs, and with uh, customers. So we are driving for joint research development projects with our customers, especially in the, in the paper field. And what we have done recently is that we have increased the amount of personnel per project more or less in, in every project. At the same time, we have reduced the total number of projects in our portfolio, but without actually losing too much of the total portfolio value. 
So we wanted to keep the most promising, the good projects, but we did some rebalancing of the portfolio. Here you can see that how the innovation is focusing on the paper and oil and mining projects. At the same time, you see that, and you might remember, that Kemira started in 2010 a project or a competence development project that was entitled SWEET, uh, which stands for the Central Water Efficiency Excellence. That was to support the strategy change that took place in 2008. And we are today, most of our projects in the commercialization phase are results of the suite. So we are very much harvesting the seeds that were planted at the time. And within the next year or two or three at the max, we hope to be having all these oil and mining and the paper projects out on the market. Here are some examples of what we have been able to commercialize as a result of the R&D or the works, work done in the R&D. There's the ChemFlight, there's the Fenobond strength concept, and there's more in the pipeline. Uh, last year, we generated about 106 million euros of the new product sales for Chemira. In 2016, the amount is expected to be 250. So a substantial growth based on the in-house new product development. And here you can see some of these ideas that are in the pipeline. We will show you later on some more concrete examples of these mentioned, uh, the projects mentioned here, like the tagged anti-scalants few words will be said about the GUA replacement uh, and there will be a Fenobind example as well. By 2016 we should have the next Fenobrite generation and this is about expanding the offering of the Fenobind into new applications. So really broadening the coverage. So all in all, we're targeting to double the innovation sales by 2016. Here, let me introduce you to uh, one example. It's a case study from where our products are being used. This is about where the polymers are used. Polymer is, a, is uh, by far Chemira's biggest uh, production line, allowing the differentiation. And basically, I'm going to show you a video where the polymers are used as a flocculation in the sludge dewatering. Oh, <laughs> now we are creating new chemistry here. It's biodegradable. <laughs> yes. And this is actually showing you a molecule of an anionic uh, polyacrylamide. And by anionic here, the, car the carbon atoms are the, the black ones. This is the double bond uh, to the oxygen atom. This is the, the red one is again the oxygen and that's a hydrogen. So this is the anionic. Depending on how many of these groups we have in the polymer and where they are, how they are placed, it uh, gives you a different type of properties for the chemical and how it reacts in different applications. And please just remember that this is just one application. This is the application where the polymers are used in the MSI business. But apart from that, they are, of course, a lot to use in the, for the paper business and in the oil and mining for different applications with different small variations in the polymer itself. But um, the next video will actually show you about the sludge dewatering. So may we have the video, please? Polymers are the most important product line for Chemira, widely used across our end customer industries in their raw, waste and processed water applications. Chemira has a wide selection of different polymer products, 
Together with our large product portfolio and extensive application know-how, we can recommend the optimal product or combination for your water and sludge treatment applications. This is a sample of industrial wastewater from a paper mill. Chemiras polymers are added to the water as very diluted solutions. Small particles are growing into larger particles which enable the solids to be easily separated from the water. After separating the solids, the water can be either recycled back into the process or conducted back to nature. The solids fraction, which is called sludge, is treated separately in sludge treatment. Usually, the sludge contains over 95% of water and as the last part of the sludge treatment, the free water is removed. Again, polymer is added as a diluted solution to the sludge and it quickly begins to form flocks. At the same time, the free water is starting to separate. The flocculated sludge is poured into the funnel where a filter retains the flocks and allows the water to run through. Usually, in large scale, presses or centrifuges are used to separate solids from liquid fraction. In the end, the separated water continues back to the beginning of the wastewater treatment and the dewatered sludge can be further utilized, for example, in composting, incineration, landfilling or as a fertilizer. Okay, let me, uh, thank you, let me introduce as a next speaker uh, Reta Strengel, who is the Senior Research Manager from our ESPO R&D Center, and she will introduce to a case study, case called Fenobind. Reta, please. So, thank you, Heidi, and good afternoon. I will present you the innovative coating binder replacement concept. Maybe it's good to tell what the binders mean in the coating formulation. They bind the pigment, pigment particles together and they bind the pigment, pigment particles to the paste paper to guarantee good coating coverage, smooth surface and optical properties. Phenopind has been proven to uh, have impact on coating cost and also having positive impact on on paper and port and product qualities in different paper and port mill applications. What does this mean and how was this achieved? The development idea was initiated when a customer, a paper produ produ producer, challenged us to reduce coating cost, coating binder and cost, and also at the same time having any negative impact on end product properties. The global binder business market for paper and board is about 2.5 million billion euros. So the cost saving potential was and is still remarkable. As also the binders represent roughly half of the coating color cost. Binder are also a functional component in paper and board making which makes the task even more challenging. The product must have a technical approval, high technical performance, because it affects on the process runnability, not only the coatus runnability, and it has a significant effect on the end product quality, like its surface strength and its printing properties. Kemira has a strong experience and long experience in wet end chemistry, especially in polymer technology. But the coating application was a new application area was for us. Case Fenopind is an excellent 
excellent example how efficient new product development works at Chemira. The novel solution was able to be developed as an intensive and enthusiastic cross-competence team work within Chemira and also cooperation with customer. Different teams, R&D, production, sales and application work together to be able to recreate this product and this new application. For example, to be able to scale up the product from laboratory scale to pilot scale and further to full scale and ensure good and desired product qualities, the pr discussion, continuous discussion and cooperation between R&D and production teams were required. Also, when we were developing this application exp experience and improving customer understanding, the discussion with application team, the technical team and the sales team was required. Also, not forgetting the customer's input. This enabled us to launch a differentiated coating pilot product for paper and port industry. Why is Fenopine so special? This will be explained in detail in the video that we will see soon, but as a summary here. It has a unique chemical composition. It has a high specific surface area, which makes possible the high finer particle distribution on the paper surface, giving and leading to increased unique binding strength, guaranteeing uh, high paper surface strength and good print result. Also, Fenobind is a more sustainable alternative. We are able to reduce the total binder amount during its binding strength, but as partly replacing the conventionally used latencies, we reduce the dependency on oil-based chemistry. Role of R&D is still significant in the development of the next generation products. We are developing binders to optimize the cost competitiveness, and also we are developing the binders to improve product performance to meet various customer and application needs. Fenopind video that will show us the product development and testing path from laboratory to, end, to printed end product. So let's have a look at the video. Binders in coating colors are used to bind pigment particles to base paper and to each other, fill voids between the pigment particles and to effect viscosity and water retention of the coating color. Penlopind products are the next generation binders for paper and board coating applications. They have unique chemical properties and high specific surface area which differentiates them from the conventional binders. Binders account for roughly half of the total coating cost of paper and board production, with SB and SA lattices being the conventional binders. Coating color rheology is tested with different binder ratios to find optimal combinations. Other natural polymer-based binder concepts have not made a significant breakthrough due to cost or technical disadvantages, such as increasing effect on viscosity of coating color. Pigment blends are fine-tuned for printability, runability and manufacturing costs. Optical parameters and coating coverage dictate the quality of the paper. Binders can be up to 60% of the chemical costs in coating, and therefore there is a high interest to study new binder concepts. Fenobind coating color is added to the base paper to improve the paper and printing properties, such as surface strength, coating coverage, smoothness and gloss of the paper. The unique binding strength 
is a result of the particle size distribution and specific stabilization chemistry used for the product. Therefore, we get more than twice the binding power with Fenobind. Increased coating coverage enables reducing the amount of high-cost pigments in board production. Fenobind is a more sustainable choice due to reduced use of oil-based raw materials. Thank you. May I introduce my colleague Lou Rosati, Vice President in R&D and Technology, and Lou is from our Atlant Atlanta R&D Center. Thanks, Rand. Be careful, the molecule. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. There's uh, currently a, a revolution going on in the production of gas and oil from shale formations. This has been going on for a few decades now partly due to the development of hydraulic fracturing techniques to enable production. So what is hydraulic fracturing? Very simply put, water and other materials are injected at high pressure and high volumes into the formation. You simply crack the rock, and then when you're producing, these cracks allow the oil and gas to migrate to the producing well. Polymers are an important component to the hydraulic fracturing fluids because they affect the efficiency of the fracturing and therefore the efficiency of the production. This is a, a dynamic and a rapidly changing market. Wolfgang previously had discussed the rigs in the U.S. and how that has shifted from gas to oil over the past couple of years. In addition, these fracturing techniques are developing quite rapidly with the basis of trying to improve the sort of connectivity of the cracks that you form and how well you can produce the oil. And then there's been some raw material volatility, particularly on the oil processing side that I'll get into. So what are the implications of those? How do we use that in terms of our innovation portfolio? A couple of points that I would like to address and then describe what we're doing and how we're addressing those. One is that these are very water intensive processes. Sometimes water isn't available and there's increased desire to recycle that water. Unfortunately, recycling the water is not easy and it has a negative performance on the fracturing and polymer efficiency. If we've been able to solve that, I'll show that to you later. Secondly, because of the new fracturing technologies that are being developed, it had normally been the case where these polyacrylamides like Heidi showed you were only used in the production of gas. And other materials like guar were used in the production of oil. Now it's very common to do what they call hybrid fracturing, which both the polyacrylamides and guar are used in oil production. That is opening up additional markets and creating additional opportunities for Camira. Uh, thirdly, this Guar product, which has traditionally been used just in the oil production, there's been a lot of price volatility, as you can see in the graph on the bottom right, and there's increasing uh, need and desire to move away for alternative materials for Guar. So how do we take account of this and innovate in this uh, billion-dollar uh, billion euro market. Firstly, we work very closely with the service companies, the actual pumping companies who are doing the fracturing, to understand their needs and then also to have them take our materials and test them out into the marketplace. We're developing new products both for gas and for oil production. And a few accomplishments that I would like to briefly mention over the past year or so. In this area of water recycle. I mentioned that the water that's returned reduces the performance of the materials. The reason for that is when it goes down into the formation and comes back up, 
it dissolves a lot of salt. This high salt containing water negatively impacts the polymer performance. We have been able to introduce two new friction reducers that have virtually the same performance in this return water as compared to the fresh water uh, normally. This enables the users to more effectively recycle the water. They don't have to treat the water, and it, uh, and it really uh, lowers their cost. Secondly, some things that are in the pipeline and are moving towards the end of sort of late stage development, early scale up. We're <laughs> focusing on products with improved handling. As I mentioned, there's a lot of water being used. The products that have improved handling have better dissolution properties. They're easier to use. We're also focusing on the cold temperature. These are liquid products, and in the wintertime in the U.S., uh, we need to have those products remain liquid down to, down to low temperatures. Those materials are being scaled up uh, at the moment. Also, we're working on a replacement for guar for the wet shale or oil production. Uh, we're in late-stage development. We're working with some of the service companies now to validate the technology. You can see from the little chart on the right, the new product that we're developing has very good prop and carrying capacity. This gel is very good. You can make the gel and break the gel. All, all that is very good. But in addition, uh, we have ease of hydration. The product dissolves more quickly. The product also, in, in addition to having good gel properties, has good friction reduction properties, which kind of dovetails to the last point. In these new hybrid fracks, it might allow for the same product to be used on both, both sides of the hybrid uh, fracture. So it eases the uh, um, use of the product, if you would. We have a, a growing multi-product patent portfolio. These products that I mentioned are covered by, by patents. We're also not just covering the patents, but the other water chemistries that go along with the, with the polymers. So, for example, we have a patent on a unique combination of biocides and polymers, where the polymers actually work better in combination with the biocides. Uh, lastly, I would like to point out sort of how we're doing the work. As I mentioned, we're working very closely with the service companies, but we're also building up our applications, competency, and our equipment base so that we can do some of the experiments and generate some of the data that initially we had relied on the service companies exclusively to provide. This enables us to get better data and to feed back to our researchers so they can more effectively build the molecules that we're looking at. So then I would like to change gears and, and give you another case. Uh, Heidi had mentioned about the tagged anti-scalants. And particularly for offshore applications, scale control is a very large problem. If left unchecked, it could actually damage the formation and basically plug the formation. How is it dealt with today? Production is stopped, and through the producing well, the anti-scalant is physically injected down into the formation where it spreads out. Then when production starts up again, Oil and water are rising up to the surface. The anti-scalant is coming out of the formation. It's protecting the formation and the pipe to the surface. What the service companies do is they monitor the level of the anti-scalant. It's decreasing over time. And they would like to measure it, and they would like to know when the anti-scalant concentration is so low that we need to re-squeeze. This has been practiced for maybe 20 years now. In talking to the service companies, though, there are two major problems with, with what I just described. Number one, this monitoring doesn't work so well. It's costly. It's time-consuming. It has to be shipped back to, to uh, onshore laboratories, and it may take days to weeks to get the measurement. And most importantly, it's not very accurate. So there's some uncertainty about when, when to retreat. The second major problem that is growing in, in what I talked about is as production moves deeper and deeper offshore, the capex associated with piping becomes greater. And now it's very common to tie multiple wells together to a single 
pipe or riser to the surface. That then complicates one's life if you want to measure the concentration of antiscalin from well one when its water is mixed with the return water from the other wells. In order to do that now, you have to basically shut off the other wells, isolate the water from well one, and make the measurement, and then go around. So that scenario, in, in essence, allows you or uh, decreases the optimum production from that facility. So how, have we, or how are we solving that problem? We've developed a series of tagged antiscalants. Uh, what is a tag? Think of it simply as a marker. It's a marker that we put on the molecule. It's a marker that we can easily measure with very simple equipment. The measurement is very accurate, so it solves the accuracy problem. It's also quite quick. We can do it in minutes to hours instead of days or weeks. And because the equipment is simple, there is a possibility of taking that measurement uh, onto the platform instead of having to do it uh, onshore, if you would. Then additionally, to get to this issue of multiple wells, imagine not putting one marker, but now two or three markers. And now you can, if you have two or three separate markers on the antiscalant, when the waters are commingled, you can easily measure the concentration and the identity of each of these antiscalants and maximize production. It's quite interesting. We have intellectual property patents filed on this marker or tagging chemistry. It's kind of an enabling technology. One could envision using it in other places. This is the first, one, first application that we will use it in. Uh, and we will show you in the video the analysis. And it's quite, quite easy, as you can see. So if you can roll the video, please. Mineral deposition is a major concern for the oil and gas industry. Mineral deposits can lead to severe disruptions in production and failure of safety critical components. That is why controlling the amount of scale inhibitor, such as ChemGuard, is critical for operators. ChemGuard targets barium sulfate scaling, which is the predominant scaling problem in offshore production. If you allow that type of scale to build up, it can result in decreased oil production and ultimately production downtime to get the affected well back to normal production. Determining residual scale inhibitor levels is a costly and time-consuming undertaking. A typical production platform has several wells feeding the process facility. To check residual inhibitor concentration, the well has to be isolated to collect the water sample. In a subsea installation, that means shutting off other wells feeding the production line. This could result in over 50 well days of lost production annually in a single pipe of four wells. Tagging the polymer allows for a simplified method to measure the amount of antiscalant present. Camera technology allows for this measurement to be conducted from multiple wells simultaneously, thus minimizing the need for production downtime to collect representative samples. Testing residual inhibitor levels is typically a complicated process that is normally done on onshore laboratories. The fluorescent tags of ChemGuard can be tested on the platform within a matter of hours using a simple spectral fluorometer. This technology is really unique because we finally bring the measurements on site. This can be done easily and quickly on the production platforms. In the end, whatever the application, ChemGuard is about allowing production people to do their job. Correct and timely management of scale inhibitors ensures that oil and gas keeps flowing.
Thank you. Then I'd like to invite Heidi back for a few more comments. Thank you, Lou. I would like to summarize the story, the innovation, innovating for growth, uh, about talking a few words about the culture. You've heard already, at least in two or three presentations, about the word of culture and about changing and promoting the change, the cultural change. We have taken some actions to uh, increase our, let's say, creativity and uh, encourage people for innovation in our company. We have started an innovation community, which means that on a regular basis, about 10 to 12 persons that have passion for innovation, passion for creating new things, new products, new applications from all over the corporate uh, company get together, share their best practices to inspire people, uh, study best practices, trying to get them and act as messengers throughout the organization. And we are taking actions to create, let's say, tools and ways and means to support the idea generation, idea collection. We, have start, we will start an innovation uh, competition. We will train our innovation capabilities on all levels of the organization to improve how we collect the ideas and how we actually evaluate and utilize them, how we fill up our project pipeline. And one of the tasks is also to create measurable success criteria for innovation work. We are following on the regular basis uh, new product uh, sales, new product gross margins, also how our patent portfolio is being renewed. We have today about 350 patent families, which means that it's uh, more than 1,300 patents in our portfolio. And we want to keep on renewing that so that they are meeting the targets for tomorrow. And this all, we want to improve and change the culture of innovation throughout the whole organization to support the camera growth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heidi, Reta, and Lou. Now it's again time for your questions. If there are some, please, over there. Oh, it's, I think it's for Lou's name, if I picked it right, uh, the shale gas story or wet uh, development. Yes. Seems to be obviously a hot topic. Um, I'm just wondering the competitive environment there. Mm -hmm. If I look at Ecolab, for example, buying Champion through its NACWA acquisition, mm -hmm. um, how, does, how do you see the, your Kimir positioning in that very high, fast developing space. Yeah. For sure you're right, it, it's pretty fast moving. Uh, I think we feel pretty good about it. I mean, we're, we're really experts in polymer chemistry and if you take a look at our friction reducing polymers, we've been able to grow that product line even though the, the market has been soft. So I think that we're able to be competitive even though things are changing. We're now turning our attention, as I said, into the, into the wet shale or oil production. It's still early on, but I, I think we feel pretty good about it. On that uh, subject, it's over on, the, on your left. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. Uh, Hubert from Impacts. Um, on that subject, uh, 100 million market opportunity euros, uh, 100 million euros, is that good for you because it's too small for other people to start to spend R&D on it and um, not having a sort of a 500 million market, is that so your advantage? Well, if you're talking about the tagged anti scalants yes, that is the market for those materials. But that is, um, as I said, sort of a niche application and, and that technology also we envision could be used in other applications. 
with all these different products, uh, are these measured on individual return on the investment that you've made, or how do you measure that you get your money back? Mm -hmm. uh, basically, each project is calculated separately, yes. You've given um, sort of three, four examples today. Um, how many are there that you're very excited about? Mm -hmm. Almost uh, at market level, instead of laboratory level. Mm. All together, you mean all together in in the portfolio? Yes, that you're responsible for as sort of the R and D head of R and D. Somewhere between, let's say, fifty and hundred. Yes, no, but yes, that are sort of ready to go to market. That's what I mean, like your um, anti scalant. Yeah, close to gate four, that would be 30. Any other questions? I had one question I took from the webcast. It was posted earlier after Petri and Wolfgang's presentation. Uh, Thank you. Let's see if there is more to come, but, but I, I will just take this one. Um, please explain your return on capital thresholds for investment spending. What has the track record been, and how do you view that alternative to share repurchase? Uh, take that one. As, as a new guy, so let me answer this uh, just by looking at the, the CapEx portfolio. So uh, roughly, or actually more than half of the CapEx portfolio is, is maintenance. Then you have maybe another 10% 10, 10 or so, which is improvement CapEx. And that leaves maybe one third of the CapEx portfolio for, uh, for kind of adding new capacity and adding new products. And, and so if, if, you, if one thinks about whether share barebacks or, or uh, returning uh, capital to the, to the shareholders in one way or another is an alternative to, uh, to additional capex or current level of capex, I think the answer is clearly no. What we have also uh, said, and it's, it was clearly marked in, the, in those slides, that we expect to see that the capex ratio will decline over the year from 6% of sales to about 5% of sales. Now, that may sound like a no small point because, because it's a one percentage point decline. But in absolute terms, on a like-for-like -like basis, it's a 17 percent decline. So while I see and we are mindful of, of the CapEx, uh, so clearly we are focusing on it and we are promising in a way reduced CapEx on a like-for-like -like, like -like basis, really there is no alternative between returning capital, capital um, and, in, and continuing investment into the business. Thank you. Is there is <coughs> Panu Laitimäki, Danske Bank. I have a question on oil and mining. So this relates to slide uh, 12 in the first presentation, uh, where you are positioning your different businesses uh, based on commodity and differentiated business. So uh, I was wondering why is oil and mining 100% uh, differentiated in North America but 50% in, in South America and, and uh, Europe? Uh, and perhaps related to that, if it's due to higher exposure to mining, for example, in South America, what is the outlook in, in mining in that division? You have given a lot of examples of innovation in the oil and gas field, but uh, how does it look in the mining side? Thanks. I would suggest as Randy is here, he can take the question directly and give you a solid and uh, right answer. Okay, I'll start with the, uh, the first one about the differentiated versus the commodities. If you recall, we started the, uh, the oil and mining business. Our first year of operation was 2009. We more or less took uh, technologies that at the time municipal and industrial was, was marketing or either the paper business was marketing. And so we, we inherited um, basically based on Chimera's asset footprint. 
And in South America, we happen to inherit a, a, a balance of, of commodities as well as um, differentiated chemistries. So that's the, that's the main reason for that imbalance. And just as you've seen us um, move through product exits, et cetera, that's what we'll continue to do. And ultimately now we have our portfolio up to 82% differentiated, and the idea is to continue to drive that. The, uh, the second part of your question was how are we doing in mining in South America? Um, we're actually doing very well with growth in South America. Um, we st before in um, Capital Markets Day, we said we're focusing on core ores or core metals, and that business is growing very, very nicely for us. Maybe just to follow up, um, but do you see like uh, possibilities for new product development in the mining side? Is it like more, more using the same stuff as, as previously, or, or is there similar uh, innovation opportunities? Yeah, we um, for sure the mining space is not as dynamic as the as the oil and gas space. That's that's very much clear. We have around in our NPD fort portfolio something like 30 projects that are um, in the NPD funnel, and I would say uh, roughly two-thirds of those are in the uh, oil and gas space. So um, much more dynamic on the oil side. Thank you. Yes, hello, uh, Carl Framer for Carnegie. W where we briefly just ran it, just to so core metals, could you just sort of remind of which they are? Yeah, the four is uh, iron ore, copper, gold, and nickel. Okay. Right. Uh, then I had an, um, the Fenderbond example I, I thought was very interesting. Now, it would bit interest me how you actually go about. We were, uh, that's... Uh, Heidi, I guess, more, or whoever. Uh, the first question is simply, there was a, um, the initiative came from a paper mill or a paper producer. So first question, does the, sort of the, those who came with the initiative get some sort of advantage versus sort of their competitors? And the second thing, I would a bit be interested in how this, then the split works. Obviously, you're trying to sell them a win-win situation. We sell you something where you get a clear advantage, and we probably make more money on it. How would that split look if you could, someone could a bit explain it? <laughs> I can take it. I can take this. So, in, concerning our first question, I just answer in general. That microphone can be. No, it's on. Okay. Yeah, Hannu says that I need to introduce myself, so I'll start with that. So, Petri Helsky paper. So, first question. In general, when we have this kind of uh, R&D done together with the customers, so, yes, the first runner has some advantage of it during a limited time because, of course, in our interest is not to lock ourselves with, with the advantage forever and ever. But, yes, without going into any further detail on that. And second, what comes to the splitting? <laughs> so that I don't go into any detail either. But there is advantage for both parties. That's clear. Uh, the, uh, I didn't mention and didn't introduce myself, Philippe from Picte. Um The uh, question is, I think, for Volkan. Um, he mentioned background, obviously, being BSF. Uh, the other gentleman from the efficiency program is mentioned Lanxess. I'm just wondering, are these sort of the, uh, the, 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 the benchmarks for efficiency um, managing a chemical company with specialty flavor to it, or um, I'm just getting a better feel for what is the benchmark, after all, for a specialty chemical company. First of all, I would suggest there is no specialty chemical company which I would take as a benchmark, to be very clear on that. Because the word specialty as such is a word, and I've said it at many occasions, I don't like. 
because this makes people complacent. It's about standardized products in small volumes. Because the life cycle for specialties exists exactly the same way as for any other product. You start with a high margin, high price, and over three, four years, somebody else comes and has either a similar technology based on a different chemistry or has a different solution which serves the same purpose. And from that point of view, it's about managing in an efficient way small volume standardized products rather than talking about specialties. And most of the specialty companies, what are called specialty companies, historically all had a cost problem because at a point cost ran out of control, the margins started to deteriorate because they were beyond life cycle and that's where all the restructuring stories started. So from that point of view, it's about managing a solid portfolio in the state of the art manner. And what you have is, you have a lot of companies and various for various reasons that have started years ago to introduce certain efficiency programs. And based on that, they have driven culture in a certain direction. And there are some companies who are strong on one side, others are strong on another side. So for example, if you go back manufacturing benchmark, then it's not BSF, it's not Lanxess, it was actually Shell, who 20 years ago developed even a computer tool where you can benchmark the refineries one against the other. Because their logic at that time was, why should something be possible at a North American refinery Whereas the same refinery in Europe has substantially higher cost. So you have to pick and choose from various strengths which companies have, and that's what we try to do. We are not in a mode that we are copying somebody because we are just following straight what this company has done. And maybe one other comment I would like to make, because there was the question about R&D. We have with the Technology Management Board a body in place that manages the portfolio. And we have what every company today has in R&D, a so-called stage gate or phase gate, you name it, process, where a project from the ideation to commercialization has to pass certain hurdles. And we take the net present value as the measure to start a project, so we have a threshold, of a minimum net present value, meaning the improvement, cash flow over 10 years, what this project has to deliver. And at every gate, the NPV calculation has to be updated. And based on that, if the project falls below the threshold, then the project is discontinued. If the project is still above the threshold, it continues until commercialization. So we are monitoring not just the return but we are also monitoring the evolution of the projected return during the life cycle of the project. Okay, maybe a question over there. Thank you, Mark Erwin and Ebli. Um, just um, wanted to ask, we've uh, talked about growth uh, quite a bit today. So I was just wondering, because um, in general, markets have been a bit soft in recent years, uh, what kind of um, capacity utilization are you at at this stage? Um, is there, where do you have bottlenecks and um, where do you have abundant capacity and how much in terms of turnover can you sort of expect from current um, portfolio without further capex? This is a question which is a little bit more complicated to answer because we have certain dedicated plants which produce a single product or two or three products of the same nature. And for example, if you take formic acid, that's such an example, they are running literally at 100% capacity, sometimes even 101%, 102%. We have multi-purpose plants where you by definition cannot get to 100% plant load because 
due to the constant product changes, you have cleaning times, which are actually a waste of, if you want, valuable capacity time. So from that point of view, optimizing the portfolio is one tool to increase the capacity without needing additional capex. And that is part of our programs, what we are doing. When we optimize our portfolio, we are looking to increase our capacity at certain facilities. But overall, I would suggest we have currently an operating rate across the board of maybe 75 to 80 percent. And, and how, how high do you think that could go? In the um, first of all, first of all uh, in the chemical industry, when you are reaching 80 percent, you are already quite okay. 90% is doable, 95% becomes an issue. Simply because the order pattern of your customers is not according to Excel spreadsheet. It's coming in waves, and then you suddenly cannot deliver anymore, so 95% capacity utilization is already quite a challenge to manage. So we have some headroom, depending on which type of plant we are discussing, a little bit more, a little bit less, but overall, not too much. It's more about freeing capacity by discontinuing certain, certain slow-moving products. Thank you. I have one question from Michael regarding lean program and uh, maybe it is savings what we, you have been able to reach, so 6 million euros, over what kind of time period uh, you have been able to collect those ones. And I know that it is quite difficult for you to estimate as you pr presumably have been collecting these low hanging fruits already, but what kind of run rate in terms of savings uh, you are targeting, let's say within one year period. Now I should be on, yes. Um, well, these savings have been basically identified in the first five to six months. However, you need to take into account here there was no specific focus just on the savings. We worked here on the organizational structure, and that was simply a byproduct, a nice byproduct, so to say. Um, run rate, I mean, at least for the fit for growth, we have postulated that 9 million euro will come from leaner operations. We will for sure... I think we over achieve that target. However, I cannot do an estimate because I said we have quite heterogeneous sites. We have different sizes of sites, different products, different product technologies, and that simply makes it unable to do any guesstimate here. And whatever I will say here is not really very reliable and I really don't want to do that. I'm quite confident that we will be over the 9 million euro that we have stated here in Fit for Growth at the end. Um, but however, how far we will get, I don't know yet. Yeah, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. And then it's time to get some concluding remarks by Wolfgang, please. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that we were able to show you that Chimera has put all the strategic initiatives into place. We are moving along our strategic path and we are focusing going forward on organic growth with at least 4% and we have quite an interesting R&D pipeline which is able to support this organic growth. At the same time, we are back at the inorganic table so we have started with the acquisition of 3F, and maybe just one side remark. You saw in Lou's video that we are currently number three in polymers globally. After the acquisition of 3F, we will advance to number two. So we are clearly building our position there. Also, if we have the right targets in an anorganic mode, in order to strengthen our key product lines and polymers are the most important products we have in the portfolio and you saw with 400 million annual revenue it's quite a sizable product line. We have as 
The biggest challenge still the cultural initiative because a project is a project. A culture changes the way of working of an organization. And ultimately, it's about getting the culture into this learning organization mode in order to make the company long-term successful. And that is something which we are diligently working now from various angles in order also to make that happen. And the important thing is, as I said before, that the middle management is a challenge in this context. We are really working from various angles. It's Michael with his in initiatives. It's Eva Sullen from HR who is working on this field. So we are really driving cultural changes from various angles in order to really recode also the DNA of the company and make the company to be aspirational with respect to not just be able to compete in today's market, but also compete in the years to come. And I'm convinced competition will not sleep. We are well advised to take competition at any time serious, and most likely competition will increase in the years to come and not decrease. I would now, after another short break, invite you for breakout sessions and taking the recommendation and the request from last year, we also have a breakout session with a new CFO and myself. So five minutes break and then we continue with the breakout sessions. Let's extend that to 15 minutes break. <laughs> <coughs> I will just, before you leave the room, give some instructions. So we have divided you to four different groups and on your name patch, behind the patch, there should be a letter either A, B, C or D. And then there is clear guides to four different rooms that has the same letter. So it should be quite easy to find yourself into a room A, B, C or D. And we will continue at 10 to 4. So 15 minutes break and then we will start the small group meeting part of the CMD. Thank you very much.